thank you so much for joining our Uncle Fertility Consortium webinar today. My name is Mindy Christensen and I am an associate professor at Johns Hopkins University, as well as medical director of the Johns Hopkins Fertility Center. Um, we are very excited to have this webinar today. It will take approximately 45 minutes and then we'll have 15 minutes for questions and answer afterwards. Please, during the talk, keep your mic microphone muted and your camera turned off during the webinar to avoid side noise and so we can have a nice smooth broadcast. If you have any questions, please post them in the chat. We'll open to discussion at the end of the webinar. I mean, at that point, you'll be able to turn on your mic and ask questions. We'll be also recording this webinar and you'll be able to watch it if you'd like in the future on the Uncle Fertility Consortium YouTube channel. Thank you so much for your support and partnership. Today, we are excited to have Dr. David Albertini um, speak today on ovarian physiology as a metaphor for building bridges between basic and clinical ARTs. Um, Dr. Albertini um, received his PhD in 1975 from Harvard University, studying cell biology of the mammalian ovary. He's had a very productive career since then, very, very productive. If I went through his entire bio, we would miss his webinar, which we're very excited to listen to. But um, I will say that today he serves as editor-in-chief of the Journal of Assisted Reproduction and Genetics, an official journal for ASRM. And in 2020, he joined the Bedford Research Foundation team where he continues his research in interest in reproductive medicine and biology. He's the recipient of many, many awards. Um, and he is presently a visiting scientist at the Rockefeller University, as well as the Center for Human Reproduction. And he continues to serve on multiple scientific advisory boards. Um, his most recent research is aimed at developing clinically useful stem cells from activated human eggs and understanding the mechanisms underlying ovarian oocyte aging in women. So without further ado, we're very excited to hear Dr. Albertini speak today. Thank you, Mindy, and uh, thank you, Mahmoud, and uh, members of the consortium for inviting me to participate in your webinar series. I'm, uh, I'm really appreciative uh, for the opportunity, and also at the outset, I do want to express uh, my heartfelt feelings regarding the tragedy last week at Michigan State University and uh, Wishing you all a, 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 a speedy adjustment to uh, this, this very serious uh, event. So what I would like to do today is uh, give you a bit of a historical perspective from someone who spent the first 20 years of his career as a basic scientist uh, studying uh, reproductive biology of various mammalian forms. In the last 20 years, I've been uh, privileged to work with a number of IVF clinics and try to gain insights into the whole uh, practice of ARTs and how basic science might uh, move itself into the practical nature of the embryology laboratory and also in the clinical management of patients. Now, for those of you that know me, I do uh, tend to carry with me some historical baggage. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll first let you know that I do have some disclosures uh, regarding my role as editor-in-chief of JARG, and I've been a consultant or speaker for various companies. And I do want to take this opportunity right up front to acknowledge the longstanding relationship between JARG and the Onco Fertility Consortium uh, that uh, Teresa and her colleagues uh, have fostered over the years. So um, just a few highlights as to uh, how I got into this business in the first place. Um, I grew up in, uh, in central Massachusetts and uh, while a college student, not far from where I live, I got a, a summer job with uh, Dr. Arthur Hurtig at the New England Regional Primate Center. And, he I consider to be my very first mentor in the field of reproductive biology and medicine. And he directed me uh, eventually to do a PhD with Everett Anderson. And for those of you in the audience, this is, a, uh, this is an image of the day that I defended my defense, 
This is Professor Anderson, and this is what Richard Schultz looked like way back then. So for those of you that know Richard, uh, we were in fact colleagues as uh, students way back when. But once I became an independent investigator, uh, I've always been fascinated with microscopy and invoked live imaging and confocal microscopy during the 80s and 90s to um, learn from knockout models of mice the importance of the communication pathways between the oocyte and somatic cells of the ovary. As I mentioned, the last uh, 20 or so odd years, I have been working with uh, various IVF clinics uh, and with uh, a, a number of people, starting with Catherine Rakowski, and most recently with, uh, with Dr. Gleitcher here at the CHR in New York. That's just a backdrop for really asking why are we having this conversation? And now that I've had some 20 odd years uh, in the clinic and have uh, you know, seen this process from the perspective of the embryology laboratory, uh, it has struck me that uh, of all the human eggs that we collect, and obviously with controlled ovarian stimulation, uh, we've been able to get more and more eggs that the majority of them are retrieved as mature oocytes, uh, but there are always some that are either at GV or M1 stage. Uh, whether you're doing ICSI or IVF, there are always some that have fertilization problems uh, and, and a, a good fraction of them uh, arrest before they reach the blastocyst stage. Um, so, so this has raised the question, what is it for especially those patients that yield a small number of mature eggs, what is it about those oocytes that is compromising their developmental confidence? And while we suspect that there are many factors at play, a predominant one, which we'll get into today, of course, is maternal age. Uh, that the developmental confidence of oocytes may in some ways be influenced in some patients by the stimulation procedure. Uh, and it's our hypothesis that in some way, this is compromising the ability of the cytoplasm to mature. So many of the M2 oocytes that we know very well successfully fertilize and go on to at least a cleavage stage, if not the blast, we believe have some inherent confidence applications that we're trying to understand to improve the efficiency of this procedure. So what's our hope? Our hope is that there will be clinical implications built from discoveries of the basic science and that uh, the, 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 the theme of uh, my talk today is that um, we will be able to integrate what we're discovering as the very complex nature of cell-cell interactions that shape our contemporary understanding of ovarian physiology and may serve as an improvement in the technology required for clinical utilization. Here is uh, an overview of what we've witnessed in the 40R 40 odd years of the evolution of ARTs. And if we look at this, one of the things that becomes apparent right away uh, is that prior to the year 2000, the, um, the technology employed in the laboratory had mostly to do with evaluating the so-called quality of the embryo based on its morphology and the mindset at that point in time in the field was to transfer these embryos in a fresh cycle as early as possible. The notion at that point was that um, the longer the embryo is subjected to culture, the more stress may be imposed on that, and it may limit either the immediate development, the pre-implantation development of the conceptus, or have long range consequences. Now, the field moved rapidly uh, over the next decade to incorporate a number of uh, changes that included time-lapse imaging, uh, grading systems were developed uh, to evaluate the quality of the embryos, 
uh, the extent of culture was increased from day three to day five. So more and more embryo transfers were taking place with, uh, with blastocyst stage embryos. Uh, and that list of potential technologies that could be brought to bear on our ability to select the most high quality embryos, those that might lead to a term pregnancy, only increased further. And two trends we see. Now, there's even more of an extended culture being used. And the, and the mindset here, quite unlike what we were thinking about uh, some 20, 30 years ago, the mindset is that we could use an embryo's ability to develop to the blastocyst stage as a mile or a sentinel of its potential to implant appropriately and support a term pregnancy. So that's the first change that we've seen over the years. The second is that we've now uh, deployed an increasing number of techniques in the process of embryo selection. Of course, single embryo transfer has been uh, transformational in our thinking about this, and it will have uh, much more of an impact in the, in the, in the short term than in our field. Um, Graining became more sophisticated with respect to evaluating both the trophectoderm and inner cell mass. Pre-implantation genetic testing has grown enormously, especially in the United States. Uh, Time-lapse imaging has now been combined with algorithms for studying the pace of development of these embryos uh, in a closed incubator setting. Uh, and so these, uh, these are techniques that have thought useful um, in predicting the highest quality embryos. And in case you don't know it, artificial intelligence is booming in virtually every aspect of our lives. Chat GPT not to be excluded. Uh, the current issue, the February issue of JARG is a special issue dealing specifically uh, with this topic. The point being that ARTs has been a moving target over the years as the growth of the field has increased dramatically. And we are still searching for an appropriate set of criteria to begin to understand what it is that allows certain embryos to successfully implant and go to term, whereas others, and we'll be looking at the percentage of these, others that may fertilize normally fail to develop. And the take home message here is that many of us believe that these events are predetermined based on the physiology of the ovary and how the female germ cell is managed during follicularogenesis. So the connections metaphor here is have we learned, especially from recent years, substantive foundational information about the physiology of the human ovary that could be extended to the current practice patterns in AIT. So again, as I mentioned, uh, the first 20 years of my career were spent in the trenches of basic science, which rule we had to rely upon animal models overall to make our fundamental discoveries. And when we wrote our NIH grants in the, in the 80s, 90s, and up to 2000, it wasn't about solving problems of infertility. It had to do with population control and the development of contraceptive strategies that would assist in managing world population. Quite a different story if we look at the last two decades. We've seen an explosive growth of ARTs. We now have materials available for fundamental research that were not available prior to this. And, and again, we should recognize that both the Oncofertility Consortium as well as the Fertilization Preservation uh, uh, Movement have added tremendously to the research potential for understanding the human ovary at a level that we could not have anticipated 20 years ago. Population control seems to be out. Uh, as you know, we recently hit 8 billion people on this planet, and we're counting. 
Uh, and, and in parallel, we're approaching 10 million ART babies as well. So what can we can begin to do in terms of linking this basic science discovery to current day practices and ARTs? Well, here's the take home message. We're learning that the maintenance of this dialogue between the cumulus and oocyte, which is taking place in the ovary, is essential to ensure the bioenergetic and metabolic support required to achieve cytoplasmic maturation and long-term development of the embryo. We see now that there is reciprocity in the signaling, the fundamental mechanism for this dialogue between oocyte secreted factors like GDF9 and BMP15 and the cumulus cells, which establish not only the quality of the cytoplasm and the developmental competence of the oocyte, but also serve to maintain the follicle in a state in a state that is conducive to supporting the survival and differentiation of the oocyte. So now when we go back and, and, and look at the extraordinary coordination that goes into communi communication pathways that allow ovulation to occur and see how this is directly coupled not only to the reinitiation of meiosis, but those series of metabolic and gene expression changes in somatic cells that we now hope if we can get a handle on these with respect to biomarkers, for example, non-invasive biomarkers, that we'll finally be in a position to improve the process of gamete and embryo selection. So, How's this dialogue going to be affected between the clinic and the bench? I think it's wrong of us to not entertain in our thinking the relationship between fertility and fecundity over the entire reproductive lifespan. This is not just about the oocyte. This is about complex physiological adaptations that take place in the ovary prior to puberty, during reproductive, uh, during reproductive, uh, the reproductive lifespan, and of course, as we'll discuss, the changes that uh, under that that happen as uh, as the ovary ages. We see this today as an issue with aging as a general problem in which the soma of the ovary and probably the organism as a whole is indirectly influencing the quality of the, quality of the oocytes. We're opening and, opening and we're sort of widening our perspective to entertain all of the factors, which may vary from patient to patient when we consider what has to be done to bring, that, bring their hopes through. So we're looking to a future where we'll come to understand fundamental mechanisms that result in primordial follicle activation, sustaining follicular genesis, and the clinical implications that will hopefully allow us as clinicians and practitioners to distinguish the hype that we hear about from the real hope we'd like to share with patients. And we'll come back to this issue of, you know, making gametes from stem cells, uh, you know, instead of really beginning to understand the problem at its most fundamental. So this concept of reciprocity has been around for uh, over 30 years. Uh, Mina Bissell, who's uh, a, a very significant player in the, in the cancer biology field, proposed this years ago that there was a dynamic exchange of information between the extracellular matrix in cells and tissues and organs and the modifications in gene expression that would allow that tissue or organ to adapt to its environmental conditions. It's been refined since, uh, since that time by her and her colleagues as a continuous 
bidirectional flow of information between cells and the extracellular matrix, which in their model system regulate the memory epithelial cell function. But I believe this holds very clearly for the situation with respect to the ovary and uh, the ovarian follicle. This has largely escaped the attention of the ART field, even though in the last decade, there have been basic science advances, which should be encouraging new ways of thinking about ovarian physiology uh, and not being uh, reticent about looking critically at the way we practice ARTs now. So building upon this metaphor of, you know, we need this communication to go back and forth. Um, we have to appreciate the fact that as ARTs have evolved over these last several decades, the mindset has been to use controlled ovarian stimulation to obtain more oocytes, more oocytes, which would mean more embryos and therefore more material to transfer. And this argument comes up all the time, is more better or not? So we'll take a look now at just some of the data uh, that's been gleaned that ask these sorts of questions. What percentage of the retrieved oocytes ever make a blastocyst? What percentage of oocytes that successfully are fertilized make a blastocyst? And this comes back to a proposal of quite some years ago now, which first implicated the, uh, the impact of ovarian stimulation on oocyte quality. Ovarian stimulation, and we use this clinically as we follow progression during a cycle, is great for follicle survival. This is why we look at the ability uh, of the follicle to make estrogen, which itself is a huge survival factor, blocking apoptosis in the follicle. But what is the consequence of this mindset and this approach to ovarian stimulation with respect to oocyte quality? So let's take a closer look at some of this. So we're at a point now where the last decade or so, there have been many, uh, many advances made in teasing apart this dialogue between the oocyte and its somatic cell environment. Uh, a, number of, uh, a number of laboratories, uh, including that of Aaron Schway and many others, really teased apart the BMP signaling system of the ovary and came to recognize that there are oocyte secreted factors that influence not only the patterns of uh, differentiation and secretion in the granulosa cells, but even those in the theca. These all feed back on one another and create this remarkable system of dynamic reciprocity based on paracrine and cell contact interactions going on within the follicle. It's a remarkable system of positive and negative feedback control. And one of the things that I'll, I'll mention later that you should know about is that these factors, many of these factors from the oocyte serve an extremely important function for the rest of the follicle, which is to prevent precocious luteinization. We'll come back to that. What's the structural basis for this? Well, it actually resides in the fact that over the course of follicular genesis, there is a really extraordinary communication system set up where each of the cumulus corona cells interacts in a variety of specialized junctions to assure that much like the heart, that there is a synchronous sharing of metabolic signals uh, to during the course of follicular genesis. So you can imagine that anything that might interfere with this communication pathway might ultimately give rise to a distortion in follicular genesis resulting from the point of view of the follicle and precocious luteinization or from the point of view of the oocyte, what we know happens during atresia 
which is the oocyte will start to undergo meiotic maturation precociously, something we certainly do not want to happen. So keep that in mind. Uh, and you know this has been teased apart uh, in great detail now, so that um, you know these many factors are coming into use. Uh, there's really not a clinical place for these things now, but it can be said that uh, we're finding, for example, uh, genetic evidence that people who may have mutations either in some of these ligands or in their receptors may have defects in ovarian physiology that could be traced back to specific mutations. So it's a complicated business. And if you don't believe that this communication system within the ovary uh, is, uh, is, is, is something that we need to not only understand more deeply, but do something about, then uh, this article by Craig Atwood and his colleagues from some years ago, this was back in 2016, even at that time proposed that, uh, um, you know, the, the need for constant communication and adjustments along the pathway of follicular genesis is essential to maintaining cyclicity and a high level of fecundity. All right, so what does mother nature say about our natural reproductive capacity? Uh, and how do we go about teasing this apart in terms of understanding, for example, the problems associated with ovarian aging. And I, I see this as really a conversation that needs to open up between the various people that are involved with uh, working on these problems on both sides, both the clinical side and on the basic science side. So when you think about it, we have a limited reproductive lifespan because the ovary becomes depleted primordial follicles, as we'll see later, cycle characteristics change with advancing the maternal age. And there are, there's one point of view, which says that the deficiencies in oocytes obtained from older patients are strictly due to intrinsic changes in the oocyte. Sitting there for year after year, they accumulate mitochondrial damage, they accumulate DNA damage, and all we should expect that if we're trying to take oocytes from older patients, they're not gonna go very far because they've been damaged as a result of aging. There are others who suggest that the consequences of this rest firmly in the development of the follicle, that there are changes in the somatic cell components of the follicle that are being altered by, for example, we know that basal FSH levels are going up with advanced maternal age. And maybe this is having some kind of a consequence on the differentiation and maintenance of function of granulosa cells. The truth of it is, it's a matter of both of these teams working together. And now we'll, we'll take a look at a couple of practical examples. First of all, as I mentioned before, uh, and, and this was really brought up uh, you know, some 12, 13 years ago now by Pasquale Patrizio and Denny Sackis, who asked a very straightforward question. What is the biological efficiency of IVF? And the original studies in 2009 asked if we look at the number of oocytes, oops, if we look at the number of oocytes retrieved uh, and monitor of those that are successfully fertilized and transferred as embryos, what fraction of these actually produce a term pregnancy? If the patients were over 35 years old, it was about 5%, I'm sorry, if the patients were over 35 years of old, then not too surprisingly, it's a very, very low percentage of embryos transferred that produced a term pregnancy. If they were younger than 35, that increased slightly. 
Now, these studies have since been repeated uh, and asked if, uh, if an embryo makes it to a cleavage stage and can make a blastocyst, what percentage of these will successfully implant produce a term pregnancy? And you, as you might expect, in under 35 years old, uh, that percentage goes up significantly. Again, the starting point is not fertilized eggs in these secondary studies, but it's actually cleavage stage embryos. And you're over 35, eight to 10% of these would make the baby. They've now repeated this in donors and I can't share the data with you, but I will tell you that this study uh, is currently under review. Uh, and uh, the bottom line is that if we estimate that our natural conception capabilities, our fecundity incidence is on the order of 33% as a species, then we're still well below that with respect to AITs. We can come back to this point. So there are a lot of things that have to go right before an oocyte that's ovulated either, either naturally or in response to a, a, a triggering dose during a stem cycle. And the biological problem has to do with the fact that this is a long history of development that has to be going on at the right pace and with the right sorts of controls before the oocyte acquires what we call competencies to develop into an embryo capable of implanting and progressing to term. This means that along this pathway, which we think is three to four cycle, menstrual cycles worth of time, although as you'll see, that's a, that's a guesstimate, um, that there are certain milestones that have to be hit at the appropriate time. So for example, uh, oocyte growth and maturity are uh, established during the earliest stages of folliculogenesis, whereas the ability of the egg to activate, cleave, give rise to embryonic gene activation, compaction, et cetera, are things that are acquired more likely during the periovulatory period. So things are put in place in a sequence that, again, will determine not only the quality of the oocyte, but whatever developmental capacity an ensuing embryo might be able to undergo either in vitro, in culture, or after transfer in uterus. So this is a clinical imperative that we have now to begin to put this, these pieces together. And what's the fundamental nature of this dialogue? Well, quite some years ago, we uh, suggested based mostly on animal studies that FSH in the follicle played a very striking role uh, in terms of either maintaining or secreting products through the zone of pellucida and into the perivalent space that would support development of the oocyte as the follicle progressed. Uh, these studies were based on using uh, FSH beta knockout in mice that revealed pretty striking phenotypes uh, that we were able to relate to the developmental competence of the oocytes. But the dialogue has become far more sophisticated since then. This is a, a paper that I encourage all of you to uh, have a look at. It's a really, really nice review by uh, uh, Jose Bertini and, and their colleagues in Italy. Uh, and it's really updated this whole system of communication and signaling at the interface of the cumulus and the oocyte with respect to the various metabolic states that are dictated by the cumulus somatic cells in the ovary. So let's see, can we put some of this in the context of ovarian aging? We've heard a lot lately hype about revitalizing the human ovary to limit or prevent follicle burnout. 
um, and supposedly directly or indirectly, this would uh, this this would uh, preserve uh, cyclicity in those women. We've also heard quite a bit of hype now. Um, as you, as you know, uh, much of the attention by the oocentrics has been that there are things going wrong with the mitochondria of the oocyte. And so there's, uh, there's quite a lot of hype that's going on about micromanaging mitochondrial metabolism. Um, I, I refer to these people as the mitomaniacs, okay, uh, that use their MMM hypothesis to explain everything about oocyte aging based on the oocyte mitochondria. And what I'd like to share with you in closing is the decades worth of experience I've had here at the Center for Human Reproduction, working with Dr. Gleicher, where I've gained insights into ovarian physiology that are being translated into changes in practice patterns for older patients. We have an average age of patients here at the CA dial that um, is 42 years old. Uh, and what we try to do is understand how alterations in the aging ovary can best be identified and managed in these patients for purposes of obviously helping these patients have a family. The first thing that I've come to appreciate is that ovarian aging is a systems problem, meaning that it has just as much to do with the body's overall integration of organ systems, whether it be nutritional status and the relationships between uh, BMI and the ovary are very well established. The brain interactions, of course, we've known about for years but one of the things that's uh, been discovered here and elsewhere is the aging ovary uh, essentially runs out of storage adrenal precursors. And there is a point at which the adrenal cortex comes into play. Uh, and whether or not uh, these uh, androgens specifically uh, can be satisfactorily compensated for by adrenal inputs is yet to be resolved, but it's an important dimension of how this ovarian aging problem is well in excess of the way we've been focusing on this. And I'll come back to the slide in a minute, but our approach here has been to try and deploy precision medicine for our older couples. And the first thing that uh, was revealed, studies published some years ago, where um, you know, it was proposed that there'd be a very individualized egg retrieval. Uh, and, and essentially it was found that the, the oocytes of these uh, aging patients were showing more and more signs of premature luteinization. And for me, this indicated right away that somehow the factors that are coming from the oocyte that limit premature luteinization were somehow being compromised. And so this was leaning these follicles towards an environment that would not be conducive either to maintaining the oocytes in a true state of meiotic arrest, but also uh, would be a signature, if you will, uh, for uh, a change in oocyte quality uh, prior to retrieval. And I'm gonna come back to this, uh, uh, this figure um, but just to highlight for you the fact that in these patients, which are essentially, as I just mentioned, androgen depleted, um, you know, they are, they are taking uh, DHEA uh, in order to compensate for this intrinsic loss in ovarian steroidogenesis uh, and, uh, you know, proceed through a stem cycle where we've also come to realize that depending on the patient's age, the maximum follicle size that we know for our younger patients to reach 20 millimeters or even more is kind of standard practice at this point. 
But what we've been noticing is as the patients age, the maximum follicle size is changing, okay? And uh, we were initially reluctant to be retrieving, triggering and retrieving from these uh, patients at that time. But as I'll show you, this has actually turned out to be a beneficial adjustment uh, in our uh, practice patterns. So no surprise here, you've all seen this figure, um, but as we know, uh, once, uh, once menstrual cycles begin, there is a slow and steady decline up to the mid to late thirties, um, at which time the rate of follicle loss is accelerated, um, leading eventually to menopause. Now, the question is, you know, why is there this change over the reproductive competent age suddenly resulting in what, what some would call a burnout of the primordial follicle pool? So when uh, Drs. Barad and Gleitcher looked at this, um, as I'll show you in a minute, it kind of brought to mind that, uh, you know, really we as a species have a, a finite reproductive lifespan as a monovular species. We know that uh, there is intrinsic attrition and that the pace of this attrition at the level of the follicle uh, is accelerated with advancing age. Um, certainly there's enough evidence to suggest that there are many other environmental and intrinsic physiological factors that can influence this, um, that, that in a physiological setting, will allow for the selection of dominant follicles. And of course, what we're doing with ARTs is rescuing a cohort that would have been designated for atresia. So from an evolutionary perspective, as I hesitate to say, there, is, uh, there, are, there are many forces at play that we need to basically understand. Three o'clock, 343, okay. I'm, uh, again, I just wanted to emphasize that, uh, you know, some of our standard practices uh, with controlled stimulation, uh, you know, look at follicular genesis, uh, somewhat independent of oogenesis within the purview of contemporary ARTs. Again, these are our output measures of how we're doing with the stem cycle, but we have to take into consideration what the longer term consequences of this may be at the level of the oocyte itself. So we can no longer uh, view this situation clinically, uh, given that the oocyte itself serves as a constant modulator of FSH and LH sensitivity directly, and survival, of course, by virtue of the steroidogenic output of estrogens. Uh, and uh, again, these factors from the oocyte serve to prevent premature luteinization. So what happens? These are our best estimates and, and, and the conditions that we all have come become very familiar with with AMH feeding back as a negative control and activation of follicles, the times during follicular genesis where androgen receptor and IGF-1 receptor sensitivity becomes critical for maintaining survival. And of course, the point at which we pick up gonadotropin dependence in the, in the form of, uh, of constructing and uh, you know, uh, controlling you know, a, a stem cycle for ARTs. Um, we, you know, we also have come to appreciate that while these follicles may be destined for atresia, we can, with gonadotropin therapy, rescue the majority of those that have reached the actual stage of development. So now let's look. What happens to the follicles and the cycles as you move from normal timed ovulatory cycles, which have a very discrete start and stop point, defined usually by the length of the luteal phase, um, when we begin to look at these aging patients, okay, we see more irregular ovulatory cycles, such that 
either the cycles themselves become separated by some point in time, or they will tend to become overlapping, all right? Uh, and, and that will mean that uh, even at the time of retrieval for a previous cycle, that dominant follicle that we would see is very likely to have been left over in the previous cycle. So these are, these are changes that are important for coming to manage uh, things in a, in, a very different, in a very different way. So those are some practical uh, aspects of the problem that we're, we're dealing with. I'm just going to skip these two slides. And you know, over the years, we've seen a lot of work go into optimizing control ovarian stimulation. Uh, and, uh, and trying to tease apart the various reagents that we've had, whether it's a highly purified HMG, the recombinant hormones came along, um, you know, the conversations about whether to use luteinizing hormone or HCG have been worked back and forth. Uh, and uh, it really gives us some pause to ask what, and now, of course, we have the GnRH agonist and antagonist, uh, and even double triggers uh, going into our, our uh, toolkit, if you will. So now we have to begin to, you know, I, th I think, rethink how this is going, okay? How this is going to influence uh, um, the quality of oocytes retrieved over time and also as a function of the patient's age showed you this slide, okay? So my take home message is that we have to view stem cycles in the context of what is going on at the soma germline interface. This starts way back with the initial activation of primordial follicles, and it will ultimately be determined by the efficiency of egg activation uh, following fertilization. And the clinical problems, as uh, Klaus Anderson and his colleagues have been saying for years, these are uh, issues that pertain directly to the use of FSH, the use of uh, HCG uh, with respect to the natural cycles of uh, hormones that we measure. Of course, HCG is a super LH. Its uh, bioavailability is considerably longer. It is not a pulsatile delivery uh, of LH as we would normally see in ovulation. And this has given us some pause as to, could there be something in, for example, just the use of HCG as a trigger that while we're getting Again, many, many more oocytes. Is this actually something that might be compromising the developmental competence of the oocyte? And this, this paper came out uh, a couple of years ago, and I, I find it kind of interesting because uh, um, you know one of the approaches, which is, which is why the GnRH agonist and antagonist have become so useful in the field. Is to, is to rely not so much on exogenous gonadotropins, at least for triggering, as it is on sources that would draw upon uh, intrinsic pituitary sources of gonadotropin. So um, uh, the Zort and Michael Diamond first proposed this model uh, where um, there are things being uh, sensitized in the follicle, such as hypoxia and closure of the endothelial cell vasculature in the theca interna that serve to limit the availability of progesterone until the follicle reaches a point where the synthesis of progesterone is released uh, in a what we know is an inflammatory cascade that typically is associated with ovulation that now has a direct effect on endogenous GnRH and will result in a spontaneous, uh, spontaneous release uh, of LH to induce ovulation, okay? And uh, this is being modeled again, 
within the context of stem cycles. Uh, and in fact, I think you can see here there have been patents filed uh, to probably bring this up to clinical use. And I will say that this group now has a, uh, uh, a case report coming out in JARG on the use of this technology uh, and the result of uh, at least two live births where, uh, where ovulation induction was done following this kind of pathway. But I think they have, uh, they propose a very interesting point here. You know, after saying that uh, it's been clearly demonstrated that the rate of chromosomal errors is the same whether the embryo achieves the blastocyst stage in vitro or in vitro. And we know this to be the case now. There's very high levels of mosaicism in human embryos. One of the important conclusions that can be drawn is the overwhelming impact of ovarian stimulation on egg quality, as opposed to the subsequent steps such as fertilization and culture. This makes optimization of ovarian stimulation protocols even more important, as evidently this is the only instrument in the arsenal of ARTs that we have to improve the quality of the egg. So you don't have to twist my arm to believe that this is, uh, that this is something that is going to require a better integration of our understanding of basic science. Uh, and to put that into the context of uh, how we manage ovarian physiology in the world of ART. So it's time to connect. It's time to connect the new research with the field as it evolves further. And I hope that I've uh, you know, giving you a sense for the fact that maturation and the achievement of high quality, high developmental quality, is a complex multi-step process that requires both the oocytes and the follicles. There are many, many more forms of maturation that we're coming to realize. And of course, the, the key one that we'd like to understand more about is how cytoplasmic maturation is not just by COS, but by culture conditions. Uh, you know, we're seeing more and more discussion about using in vitro maturation, but you know, that's going to require tailoring the, the IBM conditions to achieve uh, uh, levels of cytoplasmic maturation that will make the quality of these embryos and any offspring produced uh, not only more viable, but uh, practical in terms of adoption in the clinic. In the case of the follicle, we can now see uh, models, uh, again, thanks to oncofertility and fertility preservation. We have models of culture now where we can begin to tease apart just how it is that the somatic cells support the oocyte uh, and maybe will give us the inspiration that we need to go ahead to achieve the clinical goal which is what can we be doing clinically to retain or sustain OSI quality and improve overall our outcome for our patients. So I'm a firm believer that there are lessons to learn from Mother Nature if you, if you listen to her carefully. Uh, and over, over the years, I have uh, really been associated with some incredible colleagues, uh, as I mentioned here at the CHR, uh, Dr. Gleicher, Murad, and Pasquale Patricio, our uh, longtime uh, friends and colleagues, uh, Ann Kiesling at the Bedford Foundation, uh, Evelyn Telfer and Richard Anderson. I was able to work with them years ago in some very fundamental studies, and some of our work in the human embryo has taken place in Ali Birkenlow's lab at the Rockefeller. So uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to uh, having discussion with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was an intriguing, thought-provoking lecture at talk at just um, so many ideas. Does anyone in our audience have any questions that they'd like to either ask in person or through the chat? Hello, I have a question. My name is Gina. 
Um, I'm a nurse navigator, um, RNBSN. I work with uh, patients who are diagnosed with cancer of childbearing age. And um, there are either whispers, there's, there's um, some patients who do not have time to preserve preservation through um, ovarian stimulation. So um, the other alternative is OTC. The, right. and I don't know how recent this is because I've only been in this three years, but um, the uh, Dr. Sherman Silver is who we work with and he yep. matures the um, resting oocytes. Um, he matures those uh, in, you know, he, he does IBM and matures them to the M2 phase. So my question with that, given your talk, would those be of good quality eggs or, yeah. or not? Okay. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm uh, very familiar uh, with uh, Sherman's latest work and I've been an admirer of his uh, throughout his career for the many contributions he's made to our field. So you're absolutely right. Sherman uh, is one of uh, a number of groups now that have found that uh, when preparing for uh, cancer patients who don't have time to go through a stem cycle and store embryos if they have a partner or freeze any oocytes, uh, that uh, in preparation of the ovarian cortex uh, pieces, there are, uh, one goes through a scraping of the medullary tissue to remove it from the cortex where all the primordial follicles reside. And uh, as, uh, as Sherman has shared with you, uh, some fraction of the oocytes that are in these follicles uh, that have kind of dived down into the medulla, which is where they go to acquire a vasculature before they go back into the cortex. Um, some fraction of these do undergo in vitro maturation uh, and can achieve a metaphase two state. Uh, and your question is a poignant one because we already know that just because an oocyte gives off a first polar body, which is an indication that it has undergone nuclear maturation, does not necessarily mean that the cytoplasm has matured as well. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a good way to test this unless we actually go ahead and do what in, in that kind of case would probably be ICSI for that patient. Uh, and, uh, you know, what's, what's been reported so far, but I, but I think this, this is an area that clearly needs more work, um, is, uh, you know, if you, if you did do ICSI with these patients, what percentage of those fertilized eggs would be in quotes normal, that is show two pronuclei, undergo cleavage to a two cell stage over the correct course of time uh, or not. Um, what, uh, what I can tell you is that uh, one of the groups in Denmark, uh, Klaus Andersen's group, has published work on the same uh, population of oocytes uh, and between their group, Sherman's group, and, and one other group that I know that's doing this, there's been no consensus with regard to the culture conditions used for in vitro maturation that we believe would be needed to improve cytoplasmic maturation. Um, so without going into the details, I think the answer to your question at this point is, you may get some mature M2 oocytes, but we would question, uh, seriously question, whether those oocytes have the cytoplasmic maturation needed for development. Um, you know, that, that may change in the future, and there are a lot of other uh, factors going on here. For example, what was the original age of the patient? Where was she in her menstrual cycle when the ovarian tissue was removed? Uh, and uh, most importantly, what was the condition of the follicle from which those oocytes were, were removed? 
um, but it's a very active area of research in the oncofertility domain and the fertility preservation domain. And frankly, let's hope that these patients, like you say, who have very few alternatives when they have to initiate um, chemotherapy or radiotherapy right away, um, let's, let's hope that we'll see some advances in this area so that specific population of patients can, be, can benefit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great question and that was a wonderful answer. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? If not, it looks like we're, um, we're at that 60 minute mark. So um, we'll end this wonderful webinar. You will have the opportunity if you'd like to watch it again on our YouTube channel, but thank you so much for participating. Thank you so much, Dr. Albertini for an excellent talk. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. <laughs>